Hello and welcome to another video edition of Melendi Avenue Review. I have put positive steps into place to secure content with other people. Uh, but it still takes a little time to get all that set up. But I am working on it. That said, I don't think I have to apologize for putting on another one of my birthday lectures. Uh, birthday lectures, for those of you who don't know, are lectures that one gives on one's birthday. And I've been researching, writing, and delivering an original birthday lecture every year since 2012. And if you look up my 2012 birthday lecture, which is on this channel, you can find out some more of the backstory of where we got the birthday lecture concept from. This birthday lecture comes to you from 2016, so it's the last of the Obama-era birthday lectures. And it is entitled Lethality and Merit. So keep in mind that's from 2016 and that any references to the current day uh, refer to that time. <clears throat> it's something of a commonplace in critical literature to observe that wars that go poorly do much better as material for memoirs, poems, and other literary works and wars that go well. It's a mistake to say that any war goes well for everybody, but if nothing else, some wars go so badly that even the most ardent patriot or adept PR flack can't fill the void of the fuck-up with the kind of slick story that can deprive real literature of oxygen. On a plot level, wars that go according to plan with rapid troop movements towards straightforward goals would by necessity provide less in the way of dramatic incident than wars that tend to stalemate strategically or suffer from mission drift. The Western literary tradition arguably began with the story of a war that went sideways. It took 10 years, uh, there was terrible infighting, and at least two major curses from the gods incurred in the process of sacking one measly Anatolian city. World War I was possibly the richest literary war of them all, and works produced by people who lived in the trenches helped define literature for the rest of the century, and from no perspective can World War I be considered to have gone well. World War II went pretty well for some of the countries involved, and whatever virtues we can assign to the literature produced, it was not of such high quality or wide-ranging influence as that of the Great War. The Vietnam War went poorly for everybody concerned, except for publishers and people who enjoy good war writing. If the pattern holds, it seems as though the wars the U.S. have embarked upon since the September 11 attacks will provide future generations a rich crop of novels and memoirs. Indeed, I know one or two people engaged in projects towards that end as we speak, and they seem to be making a good start of it. But it's also worth noting that the really good books to emerge from a given conflict in all but a few cases are published some years after the war is over. Eric Maria remarks, All Quiet on the Western Front, Robert Graves' Goodbye to All That, Ernst Junger's Storm of Steel, Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms all came out in the 1920s. Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, Robert Mason's Chicken Hawk, Moore's We Were Soldiers Once, all were released in the 1980s or early 1990s. This part of the dynamic might prove tricky for our current crop of war writers. When exactly does the war on terror, or any of its component parts like the Iraq War, end? It's probably not a coincidence we're starting to see more Iraq memoirs now, five years after the withdrawal of most American troops from the country. Who knows how the dynamic will play out with the rest of the war on terror, especially given how much of it consists of actions that took place under a heavy veil of official secrecy. There's some interest to earlier drafts of the stories of these conflicts too, the ones that come out soon after or even before the fighting stops. Popular novels, journalistic accounts, memoirs, and of course film and television create narratives and give meanings to war, even as they're ongoing in a constant process of revision. Though typically lacking in the sort of universality and vision the serious literature produced a little after a given war does, contemporaneous pop war writing is often more revealing of worries and dreams of the people living in the societies undergoing the war. To put it another way, they're usually pitched unsubtly over the home plate of one or another cultural fixation, supercharged by the anxieties of war. In the case of Vietnam, this early cultural production is more seen in movies than in books, as Hollywood and pop culture as a whole struggled with how to assimilate the war, 
ranging from treacly patriotic denial, as seen in movies and songs like The Green Berets, to equally artificial tragic maundering, as in The Deer Hunter. Deer Hunters. Uh, Germany's defeat in World War I was similarly difficult to process. Perhaps the most famous body of literature produced in Germany in the immediate wake of the war were the memoirs and novels written by members of the Fry Corps, paramilitary veterans groups who fought leftists in the immediate aftermath of Germany's defeat, which dealt in rage and betrayal at the civilian society that supposedly let down the German military. These are a rich repository of the psychological background to fascism. Of course, there's any number of outlets of varying formats, qualities, and positions for those who want contemporary writing or film on the war on terror, from blogs to TV shows to, for the factually inclined some of the time, the news. But much of the most popular and definitive retelling of the war on terror falls into a category that itself can only be described as something between an artistic sensibility and an organized body of work. I'm talking about the cultural phenomenon of special forces memoirs, at least a dozen of which have become bestsellers in the years since 9-11, and which have made at least a few non-commissioned officers household names in this country. These include Marcus Luttrell's Lone Survivor, Mark Owens's No Easy Day, Jack Coughlin's Shooter, and the most successful of them all, Chris Kyle's American Sniper, and dozens more. There's enough of them that military press, especially those connected with the Navy SEALs, whose memoirs seem to be the most in demand among all the various American Special Forces units, have registered concern over the sheer number of memoirs being published by men who are meant to be undertaking secret missions. To say nothing of how many of these memoirists have had their accounts disputed by fellow soldiers. Along with the memoirs, there are a number of other kinds of books that deserve to be considered part of the same phenomenon. There are journalistic accounts of specific careers or actions of Special Forces soldiers, which often blur the line with memoirs, especially given that a lot of the memoirists work alongside journalists. Inspired by the runaway success of these books, there's been a rash of stuff published where Special Forces veterans, usually SEALs who can be said to be in possession of a brand that the other Special Forces can't quite boast of, instruct their pedestrian readership on this or that area of life. There's multiple Navy SEALs fitness guides, a Navy SEAL business advice book written by two SEAL veterans who will apparently come inspire your workplace with a presentation, for a consideration of course, and my personal favorite, a book on how to train your dog the Navy SEAL way. Along with books, special forces accounts, either by the soldiers themselves or by usually gushing journalists, are commonplace in magazines. Numerous blogs are dedicated to following their exploits and parsing their ways, and of course many of the books have been made into movies, including some big hits. Alas, the Navy SEAL dog training book is not among their number. For those of us who remember the lead-up to the Iraq War, the phrase, support the troops, is like a Madeline cookie for that whole period, summoning up the whole feeling of the time around 2003, when the U.S. embarked on its fateful course to forcibly rebuild the Middle East. The special forces genre partakes in support the troops rhetoric naturally enough, but it's clear that there's a hierarchy in these books that wasn't there in the early propaganda for the Iraq war. On top are the special forces operators, the elite men who've been through the harshest training and who are closely familiar with death and at a more intimate range than say a drone operator or an artillerist. <sighs> Excuse me. In the middle are other combat troops, often this role is played by Marines, who SEALs, like Chris Kyle, treat in a friendly but patronizing manner. They're not in the operator level, but they're honorable, they belong in the conversation. At the low end of the totem pole are non-combat troops, which as many of you will know, are the majority of people serving in the American Armed Forces. Attitudes, from them will, attitudes towards them will vary from vague contempt on the part of Chris Kyle to dutiful, judicious appreciation from Marcus Luttrell, but it's clear that they're basically extras. Civilians might need to support all troops. It's clear in any of these hierarchies that civilians of all kinds are at the bottom of the respect pile, but troopness, the quality which demands respect from civilians, is not solely a property of putting on the uniform, but includes other elements which are not equally distributed amongst troops. 
More than any direct integration of non-elite units on the part of the special forces genre, the fascination with special forces operators in this cultural moment, the fact that the publishing industry, Hollywood, blogs, etc., focus on special forces stories with little in the way of the sort of GI narratives, even heroic ones like that of your Audie Murphy or whoever else, that one sees from Vietnam or World War II books or movies, these distinguish the operator from the mere troop. The other tropes used in the early 2000s to batten down criticism of the Iraq War or other American adventures are similarly entertained but ultimately rejected in the special forces literature. The memoirs are divided on the subject of the Iraqi WMD scare. Some of them, notably Jack Coughlin's shooter, acknowledge that the intelligence was faulty but his job remained the same. Others, like Chris Kyle, insist that the WMDs were there and that the liberal media has been covering it up, a fairly common assertion in right-wing circles online. I wonder if that's still true. More interesting are the varying degrees of acceptance of the nation-building mission the U.S. embarked upon in Afghanistan and Iraq. Marcus Luttrell continually repeats the party line of whatever mission he sent on, and might have been the last person on Earth to truly respect George W. Bush. Huh, well, there's another funny change since 2016. Moreover, Luttrell owes his life to Afghan villagers who sheltered him after his unit was nearly wiped out by a Taliban ambush. He wasn't above calling for the murder of the Afghan villages who stumbled upon his unit, presumably leading to said ambush, but he was also duly appreciative of other Afghans saving his life, a representative image of one of the dichotomies of our recent wars, that combination of bloodthirstiness and sentimentality. Say what you want about him, but Chris Kyle was not sentimental. Kyle openly hated Iraq and Iraqis, with a hate ranging from contemptuous impatience for the Iraqi troops with which he worked to dull disdain for civilian Iraqis, their lifestyles and values, to homicidal, gleeful rage directed against any Iraqis who made so bold as to resist the Americans. There's a bit in Clint Eastwood's film adaptation, American Sniper, that's pretty funny to people who know a bit about the course of the war and have read the book. This is where Bradley Cooper's Chris Kyle, an altogether nicer, more complicated guy than the one who shows up in the memoir, is briefed by a hard-charging officer about the new mission in Iraq to win hearts and minds and stabilize the Iraqi state, a reference to the adoption of counterinsurgency strategy during the surge. I'd bet anything, Eastwood was reading Thomas Ricks at some point in the production process. Bradley Cooper's Chris Kyle is enthused for this change in direction, though it's hard to see how it really directly affects his job, which is sniper overwatch on infantry raids. The actual Chris Kyle gave zero shits about Iraqis or their hearts or their minds except as targets, or the mission of creating sustainable free democratic Iraq, which was barely on his radar screen as a concept. That was just so much brass chin-wagging to him. Chris Kyle characterized his job as saving American lives by ending Iraqi ones. Given the prominence of sniper narratives among the Special Forces bestsellers, not just the mega-hit American Sniper, but Coughlin's Shooter, Nicholas Irving's The Reaper, Jack Webb's The Red Circle, and many of the other memoirists make sure to point out that they were sniper trained, even if that's not their main job in their units, in the lack of, say, medic narratives, uh, we can fairly conclude that ending lives is what distinguishes these stories and not saving them. Saving lives, which snipers do by picking off potential threats when other soldiers are on the job, isn't a pretense in the sense of not being an actual concern for the writers, but it is a pretense in literary terms. That's not why the reader reads, and it's unlikely why the writer writes these works. The pretense of saving American lives is what justifies the killing, what separates it from someone just sniping people at random, and what allows the books to be read within commonly held ethical strictures. But certainly in the case of American Sniper, the runaway hit that set the tone for much of the Special Forces worship to come, killing is the point. Killing is what distinguishes the elite from the common, the operator from the mere troop, especially given how few troops play direct combat roles in these kind of insurgency wars, and the troop from the civilian, including the one reading or watching the work in question. For that matter, killing is the point more than excitement or action is. American Sniper is not a notably exciting book. It's breezily written, and Kyle and his ghostwriters have an easy conversational style, so it's not really a slog. 
But the action in the book does not approach the pace or excitement that one might read in some literary thrillers, uh, or even in literary, you know, literary, literary works, like Storm of Steel or For Whom the Bell Tolls. There's very little suspense. Kyle is often in danger, but if he's going to be killed, it's likely by what amounts to accident, a lucky hit from a rocket-propelled grenade or something. Clint Eastwood had to take a rumor of an enemy sniper that Kyle refers to offhandedly in the book to give Bradley Cooper an actual antagonist. There is no real antagonist in the book unless the people of Iraq count as an antagonist. There, Kyle has plenty of people he could characterize as enemies, but aside from pretty much the entire population of Iraq, his real bile is reserved from fellow soldiers who do their jobs poorly, senior brass who don't give him the orders he wants, and even the faintest whiff of opposition to the war on the home front. But Kyle's descriptions of action, Fallujah and Ramadi, remind me of nothing so much as a construction contractor describing a difficult time putting up a building. There's the endless niggling frustrations of getting a complex task right. There's the appraisal of crew members and employees of varying qualities. There's a lot of work and a certain amount of danger, but little in the way of real tension. Even the descriptions of the actual shots he takes aren't especially vivid or bloody. What is vivid in American Sniper is Kyle's voice, his endless, unabashed braggadocio, his joy in his job, and disincla disinclination to the kind of lacrimose pondering on the horror of war and his association of these qualities with the best America has to offer, i.e. he himself, Chris Kyle. American Sniper is an extreme in pretty much every respect, and that's leaving aside Kyle's tall tales, like his oft-reported bragging about sniping looters at the Superdome during Hurricane Katrina, which is as revealing as it is likely untrue. It's extreme in terms of the bile it displays for Iraqis, and most foreigners for that matter, though the Polish soldiers Kyle worked with come off pretty well, and the spite it shows for soldiers Kyle deems beneath him. As mentioned before, Marcus Luttrell has a more idealistic take on both the American fighting man and the missions on which he is sent. The other memoirists are pretty restrained in most of their personal judgments. And here it's worth noting that the Army and Marine writers are typically more restrained in every capacity than the SEAL writers, for whatever that's worth. Both Luttrell and Kyle are pretty extreme in terms of their bile against domestic critics, with Luttrell indulging in fantasies of how ill attended the funerals of those reliable hate figures. The media would be compared to those of his slain comrades, but plenty of the other writers have only pro forma denunciations of critics or even just a bemused indifference towards them. As one would gather from the title, survival plays a strong role in Lone Survivor, and there are other important elements in these stories that we'll get into, but at bottom, killing is what distinguishes them. Killing, especially killing in an intimate way, whether through a magnified scope after watching their marks every move for hours sometimes, or killing them close up by ambush, not by drone or by artillery or from a tank, is what individualizes the operator, makes him a character with authority as opposed to a troop, part of an undifferentiated body which commands respect but not the same sort of hearing. The killing of the operator not only authorizes them to speak to their own stories, but also to the right way to run a business or to govern the state of Missouri, where SEAL team member Eric Reitens recently won the Republican nomination, etc. Operators may be experts in any number of things, but it's a mistake to say that they are treated like experts in the same sense we might treat a forensic specialist or an epidemiologist. It's not their expertise that matters, but their authority. Expertise can be quantified, credentialed, objectively appraised, or challenged. Authority cannot. It can be imbued or endowed or simply refused and defied, but it resides in the subject, not in some granting body or within a body of knowledge, though mastering certain bodies of knowledge is part of some types of authority. Still, it's not the expertise, but the authority of the operator that draws readers not just to their stories, we're all authorities in our own experiences after all, but to their ideas about running a business or governing the state of Missouri Though it's worth noting that the dog training guy is both an authority and an expert, having actually worked with dogs in the service. Dog training and book sales aside, what is this authority for? There's a huge market for books and movies that promulgate and proclaim the authority of the operator. 
Why is this? And what uses are or can it be put to? Unlike the stories of other figures whose high achievement in a specific area gives them an aura of authority, star athletes, say, or entertainers, the stories through which the operators articulate their authority also articulate an alternative structure of meritocracy to the one that both selects and affirms our political, economic, and social leadership, including the leaders who sent them into war. Athletic memoirs, by and large, accept the mainstream idea of merit, or at any rate, don't really criticize it. Special Forces memoirs, and the larger cultural phenomenon of the operator mystique, promulgates an alternative concept of meritocracy to that which justifies our elite. While many of the operator memoirists criticize this or that element of our meritocratic elite, more often vague categories like the media or the politicians or the liberals than actual individuals, they usually don't explicitly challenge the mainstream meritocratic vision or those who draw power from it. That's less dangerous than an explicit challenge, but arguably more subversive. What the true believers in the meritocracy of the operators do is undermine the basis on which our authorities claim the right to their overweening power. Real merit, the one thing most Americans agree can legitimize power, belongs in a whole other conceptual universe. The operator memoirist and his followers reading and watching him, engaging in the ideology through the books and the movies and the magazines and the blogs, tell us. The meritocratic assumptions of our society are so ingrained in most of us, including, I think it's fair to say, the people in this room uh, or watching this YouTube video, that they're often hard to see or articulate, so I'll try and make clear what I mean by the term meritocracy. Most of us have some understanding of one element of the basic meaning, that those most qualified should be in charge of a given enterprise, a business, a government, whatever. The other important part that sometimes get mi gets missed is the belief that there's an objective standard by which to gauge merit. Partisans of every system of governing or choosing leaders think that their preferred system produces the best leaders. Aristocracy, the term often held to be an antonym to meritocracy, also means rule by the best. What distinguishes meritocracy is its elaborate, transparent, and objective measures for determining who these best are. In almost all instances, these measures come down to tests of intelligence or academic aptitude or achievement. The first use of the word meritocracy comes from a satirical essay written in 1959 by Michael Young, a British Labour Party apparatchik who sought to depict a future where a mania for testing and for social separation by intelligence test score from youth onward produced a society both silly and vaguely sinister, and in no way in line with the aims of labor as Young understood them. Alas for Young, the term came to be taken up as a positive, first by other labor people, then by much of society at large, both in Britain and the United States. People have since come to use the phrase to describe things as far back in time as a system of examinations used to select bureaucrats in imperial China going back thousands of years. In the U.S., it's also associated with academic tests, especially the Scholastic Aptitude Test, introduced by the College Board in 1926. The backers of the SAT have been the winner in a decades-long contest both to place as much of college admissions on a meritocratic basis as possible and to make their test, the SAT, the most important objective metric of what constitutes merit over various other means that were proposed as the system came together during the post-war explosion in college enrollments. It's important enough to the structure of the American meritocracy that it's reasonable to call it the SAT meritocracy, as shorthand and to separate it from other versions of the meritocratic concept. Practically, the SAT and other meritocratic measures undertaken in the mid-20th century were designed to manage the massive growth of institutions like schools, corporations, government, and so on in a rational way. Ideologically, the presumption behind the idea that future elites could be drawn from universities and that these universities would in turn select them via tests like the SAT said a lot about the vision of the future the college administrators and the like saw ahead of them. Some combination of being good at the subjects, the SAT tests, and the temperament necessary to subject oneself to learn those skills and regurgitate them for a test 
would be the qualities needed to face the late 20th century, essentially technical and management problems. The actual shape of society, its political arrangements, its power structures and hierarchies were settled matters. The SAT wasn't and isn't about to prepare you to think too much about those. The meritocracy of schools and tests both promised mobility, those who could pass the test could raise up the social ranks, but also promised to close the door on structural social change. In short, it was one of the more encompassing liberal visions of the mid-20th century, both in terms of promising liberation within a given set of structures and utterly forswearing the ability to change the structures themselves. Ironically, after the experience of depression, political agitation, and war opened enough of the previous hierarchies to allow for this new dispensation. One thing about being a largely accepted background assumption of how we go about our lives is that critiques of the assumption are easy to articulate where defenses of it often stumble. We can all point to the obvious flaws in the SAT meritocracy. It largely fails on its own terms, after all. The pre-existing elite of wealth and power still reproduces itself, passing its status on to its children, both through the expedient of holes within the system, such as legacy admissions to high-end colleges, and due to the fact that the, wealth, the wealthy can basically buy the achievement markers that the system looks for. The SAT meritocracy fails to produce leaders much better than those produced by other systems, and their failures are motivated by many of the same traits as any other leaders in history, hubris, greed, ignorance, action bias, etc., the signature initiative of the first generation of leaders to be produced by the post-war meritocracy was America's intervention in Vietnam. This is why David Halberstam gave the people around JFK the facetious nickname, The Best and the Brightest. Every major fuck-up of the lifetimes of most of the people watching this video, from the Iraq War to the mortgage crisis to our turn to mass incarceration as a solution for social issues, was vetted, was overseen by people vetted by a system meant to produce people objectively smarter and more assiduous than their peers. Insofar as there is an articulated defense of the system, it's typically some mixture of minimizing the scope of these fuck-ups, emphasizing the good personal qualities of our leaders, and admonishing the critic to come up with a better system. Some of the more daring defenders insist that the problem is that meritocratic elites have not been given enough power, that democracy is fouling the whole thing up, and that, but that's usually the sour grapes when one or another faction loses a big vote more than anything else. Explicit defenses of the SAT meritocracy tend to be rather lame and easy to mock, think David Brooks. Implicit defenses, like the sort of meritocratic stories which underlie many of our favorite fables, from sports stories to children's television to Barack Obama's autobiography, do a lot better. Explicit critiques of the meritocracy tend to follow predictable and usually rather banal lines as well. There's lefty critics like me, going on about the system's mass inequities or fundamentally anti-democratic bias, setting off our pop guns at a system way too big for our critiques to do much to penetrate, scathing and original, though mine, I mean ours, are. There's the occasional conservative critic who dislike meritocracy for lacking spirituality or things along those lines. Uh, one imagines David Brooks mixing it up in his utterly ineffectual way with fellow Times op-ed denizen Ross Douthat, who wrote along these lines in his memoir of his time at Harvard. There's little in the way of a social reality in this country to give weight to these critiques, either in terms of the more democratic, liberatory agenda on the left, or the mere, more spiritual agenda on the right, outside of isolated religious or other intentional communities. For its part, the meritocracy of the operators as implicitly outlined in the genre I've been talking about, makes critiques that resonate with the felt reality of millions of Americans, the vast majority of whom were never in the military and never will be. It does not demand that Americans think of a new way of structuring society. The hierarchy is fine. It should just value different things and different people. It doesn't demand asking too many uncomfortable questions about America's place in the world or Americans' place in their country. In fact, it typically discourages asking those kind of questions. The hardest question it permits is the occasional intimation of treason on the part of some of our civilian higher-ups. But that's not to say that everything's easy in the world of the operator meritocracy. 
Almost all of the memoirs contain lengthy passages pertaining to the difficulty and selectivity of Special Forces training. Many SEAL memoirs seem as interested in detailing their rigorous selection and training process at the Coronado Navy base as they are in the actual missions they undertook. Probably helps that training is presumably under less official secrecy. Like the role that college plays to the conventional SAT meritocrats, Special Forces training certifies the operator, humbling him even as it grants him exalted status through finishing it. But it isn't just SEALs who happen to finish the school who become the ideal figures for the millions who look to them for an alternative model of leadership. It's the SEALs and other operators, though I think the special place of the SEALs in this lore deserves some note, who fight and kill. In the spiritual economy of the Special Forces genre, the training, more than preparing the operator for the physical rigors of his job, is what allows killing to go from being a despicable act, like when an Iraqi militant does it, to an act that endows a special knowledge onto the operator that elevates him above other men, even other troops. Instead of killing making you upset or sad or guilty or simply traumatized, you become someone who understands the most extreme element of the life cycle. This knowledge manifests itself in strange ways. It's not just whatever existential knowledge comes from having undertaken an extreme irrevocable action, though it's also that. It's a way of relating to the world that grants knowledge through some means both below and above rational cogitation. Some sort of Zen oneness with the world through violence and the authority that familiarity with violence supposedly imbues. The different operators manifest this to varying degrees, but this knowledge extends well beyond the battlefield into seemingly every area of life. Relationships, assessments of the character and ability of other people, technology, the list goes on. Predictably, Chris Kyle was the most extreme in this. Correct about every given decision about whether or not to shoot a given Iraqi, to when to leave the Navy, to placate the medics and his wife, right in every instance until after his book was published, and he decided the right way to treat combat-related PTSD was by taking those affected by it out in the country to shoot off guns. The other writers are less extreme, but typically, when they're not right about something, it's due to self-doubt. If they believe in themselves, they are right. And moreover, unlike most other positive thinkers out there, they can cite their training and accomplishments as proof for their authority. This equation, killing to authority to knowledge, loans itself to be plugged into pre-existing ideological fault lines surrounding authority and identity in this country. Though it's worth noting that a fair number of operator memoirs choose not to do that and stay out of politics. Chris Kyle and Marcus Luttrell did this quite explicitly. Luttrell most recently by endorsing Donald Trump for president and laying the death of both his own fellow SEALs and of the Americans at Benghazi at the feet of the Democratic Party in the culture of weakness it supposedly represents. Especially as the conventional SAT meritocracy visibly fails, either to make the lives of average Americans better or to undertake a successful foreign policy, its sources of authority begin to come under question. Moreover, unlike success at things like the SAT or college, the sorts of things the operator meritocracy values bolster and affirm the values of traditional masculinity. As anyone with an internet connection can tell you, those who most value masculinity seem to always think it's under siege from vast, shadowy, sneaky forces, the sorts of forces the operators once dealt with and who can be dispelled by those displaying the same sort of virtues. Much of this is a distillation of the sort of backstab legends that become popular, or became popular in the wake of our defeat in Vietnam. Weak people, protesters, humanitarians, bureaucrats who believed they could run a war in an administrative, numbers-driven fashion, prevented us from winning in Vietnam. The legend, which has since become semi-official in large parts of the culture, goes. These weak people, in turn, spread their weakness throughout the culture, in the form of racial and gender liberation, consumerism, distrust of authority, irreligion, the usual litany of horrors we're all familiar with and that varies from plaintiff to plaintiff. While this is a familiar conservative lament in the special forces literature, it floats free of partisan politics and becomes a general attitude towards the world. Strength and goodness aligned against weakness and evil. You'd figure that'd be a pretty unfair fight in favor of the strong, but what do I know? 
While Luttrell occasionally tries to sheepdog the sentiment back towards conservative politicians, there's little evidence that Chris Kyle gave a damn, and less so from the other operator memoirists. Authority comes from the operator, not from politicians, even politicians who exude strength. Perhaps the clearest picture of this comes from the film version of 13 Hours, where Clint Eastwood smoothed off many of Chris Kyle's rougher edges for the film version of American Sniper, Michael Bay made the chasm between the authority of the operators and the falseness of everyone else much clearer in 13 Hours than in the book by Mitchell Zukoff, on which it is based. Zukoff, it is worth noting, is a journalist and not a memoirist, though he worked closely with the Benghazi contractors. The ex-Special Forces guarding the secret outpost in Benghazi and Libya, especially the ex-Seal, played by Jim from The Office, exude the calm and preternatural knowingness of the operator, but in an even more exaggeratedly macho fashion than even Chris Kyle dared. They're forever doing shirtless exercises outside, incorrectly predicting aggression, and impregnating their stateside womenfolk. The civilians are charged with protecting our screaming, literally screaming once the shooting starts, representations of the femininity and weakness of the conventional SAT meritocracy. In an absolutely brilliant casting move, they got David Costabile, who's a fine character actor, perhaps best known for playing the man Kirsten Shaw cuckolds in favor of the non-attention of Breton Germain on Flight of the Concords, for the CIA chief of the Benghazi station. In the book, the unnamed chief is depicted as mediocre at his job and slightly snobbish. In the movie, he's depicted as the picture of everything wrong with American government. He's a weak bully, literally calling the operators hired help, bragging about how he and his CIA pals went to Harvard and Yale, and yelling at Jim at the office and his friends for exercising too loud outside of his windows. And a line that indicates that someone at the studio has at least fleeting familiarity with internet-based masculinity culture, one of the operators grumbles that Costabile's character gets off on telling alphas, that is, alpha males, men like the operators, killers, lovers, guys who haul tires around to get swole, what to do. Of course, once disaster strikes and the zombie army of brown people attack, the tables are turned and Costabile only survives through following, following the barked orders of the men with the guns. We don't know if he learns a lesson, and we don't care. But the viewer learns again how the world works, and whose merit counts for more, the operator or the highly educated bureaucrat. Presumably, this would be the part where I tell you about the threat to democracy all this poses. Men enamored of violence and experience in its most direct application, leading armies of slavering reactionaries to enact every fantasy of revenge against the libs that ever graced a message board. Alas, I cannot. The trail might want to stand on the podium with Trump, but he's not running himself, and all the Special Forces memoirs I've read are in agreement that electoral politics are too much of a headache for them. Eric Greitens, the ex-seal running for Missouri governor, looks likely to lose. Haha, <laughs> that didn't turn out... And if he wins, there's little evidence that he's a particularly extreme politician. It did turn out he's a rather extreme creep. Uh, hell, even 13 hours failed, both in terms of spreading the Republican talking points on Benghazi, Hillary Clinton isn't mentioned at all, and in more typical movie industry terms. It just barely made its money back, largely through overseas sales. It was not a mega hit on the American sniper model. The American military as a whole shows little inclination towards intervening in American civilian life, beyond seeing to it that its budgets and prerogatives stay intact, something the civilian leadership on both sides of the aisle seem more than happy to grant. More than anything else, the concept of meritocracy is a way of managing the masses in a democracy. Meritocracy explains why people are where they are in the social order through neat, understandable stories which many people find relatable and compelling. In the classic manner of successful liberalism from John Locke's day to our own, the mid-century American liberals who promulgated the SAT meritocracy in which we are embedded were able to yoke the stories they told about the relationship between individual and society to the actual operating mechanisms of that society, never on a one-to-one -one basis, but well enough. Meritocracy was and is both a myth and a functioning system. Its mythic stature becomes more important as its failures become more evident as it becomes increasingly clear that it's neither internally consistent nor capable of avoiding massive failures. 
we can see the operator meritocracy in the stories it tells about the relationship between violence and authority as a first draft of an alternative, an effort to manage a portion of the population for whom the SAT meritocracy's authority is declining more quickly than most, either due to conditions that make school seem an unlikely route to success or to pre-existing cultural disinclination towards what the SAT meritocracy represents. The danger in the operator meritocracy isn't the operator, few in number and dependent on the larger military machine. The power there is in the stories, and there's few things less predictable than what the results of masses of people following an inchoate but vivid dream will be. Hmm. Yeah, interesting essay for 2016. Who knows how interesting it'll be in 2021, but uh, usually this will be the part where people chime in for questions and comments. So feel free to do that in the comments. Thank you, and until next time.